I am going to begin by uh, explaining how I became involved with emailing Alan in Europe, and then how we started writing the book, and how Angela came in first as somebody who thought the book should be published almost before anyone else did, and then someone who played a central role in shaping this book. And by the way, this book is now having a tremendous kind of underground life in the Bronx, being passed from hand to hand by people who grew up in the Bronx in the 50s and 60s, and by teachers and social workers who work with young people. We haven't gotten a major review in any newspaper. We haven't done any radio or television appearances, uh, with the exception of WFUV. But this book has taken on a life of its own because it touches a chord with people who grew up in the time and place that Alan did. So let me begin by talking how this started. Um, about seven years ago, I was asked to start doing research on African Americans in the Bronx because uh, there was virtually no database that described the over half million people of African descent in this part. I began doing this with an oral history because when there's no written record, that's how you begin to find out what's important to ask the people who live in, you know, in that community, what, what, what are the important churches, schools, uh, clubs, and other institutions. I began with the first person I knew who was a student of mine at Florida named Victoria Archibald. She happened to live in a housing project in the Bronx School of Patterson Houses. I interviewed Victoria, and a whole world up and opened up to me at a time when public housing was a wonderful place to live, where people slept with their doors open, where people of different nationalities shared their food and music and culture, where that, the projects were clean, had great youth programs. And then what happened is other people found me and said, when are you going to interview me? And before I knew it, I was deluged with requests for interviews. Then, a gentleman named Michael Singletary, uh, who was a well-known radio producer and artist, said, you should meet my friend Alan Jones in Luxembourg. So I emailed Alan and said, Alan, this is what I'm doing. And we started corresponding. And Alan and I have a couple of things in common uh, that would, might surprise you if you didn't know us. Uh, we're both uh, former athletes, uh, both nearly crippled as a result. Um, we both um, have a sense of humor, sometimes more of a sense of humor than we should, um, and we've both been in trouble. Uh, Alan for drugs and me for, for political activism, and we've both been in jail. Now, if you want to press a professor in jail, well, yeah, uh, but not for long, but still, yes. So we hit it off. Then Alan read. I wrote a memoir called White Boy Memoir about how I ended up teaching in a black studies department. Alan read it and said, I'm gonna write a book and call it The Rat That Got Away. So my attitude was, send me a chapter. So Alan sent me a chapter and I, I got very excited because I realized he was an extraordinary storyteller. He could make you feel like you were in the environment where you were and he had a feeling for dialogue. So I encouraged him to keep writing, and then, after about 16 chapters, he wrote something on the heroin epidemic in the Bronx that was so graphic and so powerful that friends of mine who read it said, you have to get this published. One of those people was Angela O'Donnell, uh, who had just come to Fordham. Uh, she was a poet, she was a, write a fiction writer, and she was also teaching writing at Fordham. And she read it and said, Mark, there's really something here. Then uh, Fordham University Press saw it and um, decided that they were gonna publish it, but they sent it out to a great many readers who all said, add this, add that. And Alan and I went through a process of expanding the book to almost twice its length. Some of what Alan was asked to do was very painful. He was asked to describe his family, asked to describe jail, 
and, and you know, some things he went through in more detail than maybe he wanted, but the result was, you know, the book became very rich in texture. So we had this book, and then we realized something. This book, which was so rich in texture, needed someone to take command of it and make it readable. Make it so you couldn't put it down. So I remember that Angela really identified with this book, and I knew what a talented writer she was. So I said to Ford and Press, hire Angela to make this a readable book. Make this a book that you can't put down. And this, she spent a year and a half living with this book, and constantly in communication with Alan, and this is what, you know, you see a book, you think, okay, written by Alan Jones and Mark Mason, but Angela had as much of a hand in it, certainly, as I did once the book had all the material been in. And Angela also, this is where I have to get very emotional. She, I, I knew, I understood Alan's sports life. I understood his street life. I even understood his jail life. But Angela understood Alan's spirituality, that that was central to who he was, and made sure that Alan's spirituality and religious life were foregrounded along with everything else. And so what you have here is a combination of people putting their heart and soul into something. It's Alan's story. Andrew and I could, could not possibly make up some of the scenes of this book. We were not in the male penitentiary at Rikers Island in 1969. You know, I, you know. We were not uh, playing basketball in the Rucker tournament. We were not in bars in Luxembourg. But um, we had a feeling for the kind of person who Alan was. And the, the way what we wanted to do each in our own way, is do what we could so that Alan's personality could come to the fore in all its complexity. And also the neighborhood and community he lived in could come to the fore in all its complexity. And so the three of us were, were like working together to, to create the, the book that this is my friend Bob Bones, one of the first to get involved with the Bronx African American History Project. Bob is a graphic designer and a publisher who grew up in, in Morrisania. And about a month ago, Bob called and said, Mark, this book is me. This book is my life. And that's what we wanted. And, but it, 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 without the three of us, it wouldn't have happened. This is a team, in other words, this book is a team effort. And I think it, that's why it was important to talk about this. And so that's it from my perspective. I'm now going to hand it over to Alan to talk about what it was like from his perspective and then Angela. So you'll see each of us, what this meant to us as a prophet. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. I just want to say that, uh, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And um, I just look at this as, you know, when you see that strength, I could not have done this alone. And as a matter of fact, I stopped writing for about six months after I realized I had to give a lot of myself. It really hurt me. It hurt me because uh, I had to go inside myself to places I wanted to forget. We all have skeletons in our closet that we really like to keep buried and don't like to deal with. In order for me to write this book, I had to go there. And I didn't, I, I, I had a very, so what I did one day, I stopped writing for six months, and just as I was about ready to go on vacation in Greece, I emailed mom. I emailed mom, and um, he told me, he said, wash the cheap <laughs> in Greece. Gave me a little joke. And um, I was sitting on the beach, and I sat down, and before I, before I started to write again, I just said a little prayer. You know, I just said, you know, I can't do this alone, Lord.
Now that was, well, I must say that um, what helped me was that I was going to, um, um, I went to private school, predominantly white, my prep school. And then I went to a junior college where Billy Graham, Marjorie Anderson Junior College, was predominantly white. And um, black were minority. And the blacks that they had there were imported, like from Nigeria or from other countries. They were foreign exchange students. So I was uh, getting accustomed to, you know, being around the different class of people, you know, not with different brands and, uh, and the earrings and the big gold chains, you understand, and the high fives. You know, I got to see how people really talk to each other. I got to learn how to look somebody in the eye and shake their hand and, uh, and you know, to study and, you know, just to learn the proper way, not the street way. And so when I got to Europe, I think that the biggest, the biggest, the biggest thing for me to transition was the food. <laughs> As soon as I got off the plane, I said, man, there's no McDonald's, ain't no fast food, Europe is behind. You know, because in Europe at that time, um, they closed from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, two hours every day to eat. And I, I found that disgusting, you know? I said, you guys are crazy. So I said, we only eat from 12 to 2, and then they open up at 6 o'clock. But everybody, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, they, they, um, they work to live, you know? And in America, we live to work. It's a big difference, you know? I mean, because when you work to live, you take, you take your time. Everybody was taking your time, everything was slow. When you come from the city, you're going, you're going tomorrow, you're going that today, but everything's so laid back. So I had to get used to that. And um, as far as um, racially dealing with Europeans, well, um, for me, I had a mission.
themselves want to write a book and have this image of a lonely writer by themselves, you know, in, in an attic or in, in, in a room. And this process was so different. Uh, and I also found, because I've worked on other books, that writing is really a collective and social effort at its best. That when you write, it, you should be sharing with other people. And, and that's what, this was a process of sharing in the truest sense. I mean, once Allie and I had our 16 chapters, from that point on, we did nothing without sharing it with people. And I made sure that I shared it with people who were writers. Angela was one of them. A friend of mine named Greg Donaldson, who wrote a great book on the crack epidemic called The Bill, is another. And he has a new book coming out uh, soon called Zebra Town. So I had two writers who first let me and Alan know that this book, in its form, it really had potential. But then we did something else. When this book was just before we gave it to Angela to shape it, and I was absolutely fascinated by Angela's description of how to create a driving plot that made you not want to put it down. That was something, when, I, when people told me, I read the book on the beach, I read it in the airport, I can't put it down. Or like Michael, we have a new David for him, Dean Lake, he says, he reads it to, before he goes to sleep. You know, that's, as a writer, that's what you want to hear. And that, that's one of the things that Angela knew how to do with a poet's sensibility. Okay, but this is also a, a work of a Bronx African American history project, the first published work. It is, some memoirs are fictional, like Peary Thomas, Alley's Mean Streets. It's, it's a synthesis of of events that didn't happen exactly the way they are in the book. This book was written to be historically accurate. So we had fact checkers. Before we gave the book to Angela, we found two women who grew up in Morrisania and in, in Patterson houses. One is a photo editor with the New York Times named Gail Slack. She was the Patterson Houses person. And Inez Robinson grew up in Morrisania, where a lot of the action took place. We said to them, please tell us if not only is it, if anything is wrong factually, but if anything feels wrong. And they told us, and, they, and we said, anything you tell us that seems wrong, we're going to change. And we did. So by the time Angela had the book, it had gone through two fact checkers. So, and, and, and we want, and so one of the things when people say this book is, 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 is accurate, and it, it, it's, this story is my story, and the number of people told us there's a reason for that. We made sure of that. So if you think about this, this is a combination of a lot of different people giving input. Uh, but there's also, I guess, the, to me, the intangible. And this is why all of us are sort of on the verge of tears here. Because why, how could three such different people decide to share this, of their lives this way? We don't, we don't really know each other that well. Even Andrew and I, who are colleagues, we don't. I, I discovered a lot of things about Angela when I read her new book of poetry called Mine. And I, then I understood even more why Angela could adopt Alan's story. But there was something intuitive that all of us saw of ourselves in this and felt that by joining forces, we could make a story that would make a difference. Thank you, Dexter. Thank you. I just want to say that today was the first day I met Angela. <laughs> <laughs> the first day I met my editor after all these years, you know? So I said, oh, it's too long. I just want to say that. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's like, how do people trust each other? That's part of this. I mean, and trust is a fascinating thing. Somehow, Alan and I are trusting each other enough to be waking up at 3 in the morning, night after night. My wife is saying, well, my wife thinks I'm crazy already, but she thought this was particularly crazy. Yeah, are you going to get this book published? You know, 
know, this is nuts. You're up at three in the morning emailing somebody and who you've never met. It is fun. Actually, how hard the three was to mine. years, Mark would remind me. still going for it. Yeah, but there was something that I saw and something Alan saw and that in our own way, it, we didn't need to be. And then Angela saw something in this that, you know, we're all the sum total of all our experiences. And we brought this, and then, and now to me, the most moving thing about this is to, when we went to an elementary school in the Bronx, and there were 20 teachers in front of us, uh, there were about 15 African Thank you. 
I think that in some ways, this is a wonderful, I don't want to use the word success manual, but it, it provides a practical guide for young people how you get out of trouble when you're in it. What are some of the traits you need to learn in order to move beyond the situation where you're trapped? Now, one of the things that Alan had going for him is he may have been involved in street commerce that was fairly uh, destructive, but when he met a coach or a teacher or an adult relative, it was, hello, how are you, thank you, please. He was, oh, he, he knew how to, what today we call it code switching. He could go from the street language to the language of the family, the language of the school, and later the language of business. And that's a skill I think we have to teach our young people today. You know, if you're living in where PS 140 is, you have to have a certain way of walking to ward off aggression, especially if you're a boy. You have to walk strong. You have to dress a certain way. You have to speak a certain way or else you're going to be victimized. I wish it wasn't that way, but unfortunately it often is. But you also then have to be able to, when you're dealing with adults, be gracious and respectful and able to, you know, to operate in a different environment. So Alan could do that. And uh, he could do it when people, when he came out of jail, when people wanted to help him. If you come into the office and you have your hand on backwards and you have a scowl on your face and you have, you know, you look angry, then the person is not going to want to get you a scholarship. You know, they're just going to say, well, this person will embarrass you. But if you're polite and gracious and, and kind, then people will want to do something for you. And Alan is a perfect example, not only after he got out of jail, but um, when he got to Europe and he was able to take, his, you know, create opportunities to find jobs in Europe when he met people. You know, though that sort of social skill is something that many young people don't have now, and they need it. It's something that we as teachers and mentors should, should show them because it, go, it goes a long way to taking advantage of opportunity. I just want to say one thing to, to end this so we can bring that whole thing. The bottom line in this book is hope. Okay? It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's an uplifting book. It's, it's, it's to let let kids know, people know that no matter how bad things are, no matter how, no matter how grim they might look, there's a way out. You know, you can always change your path. You're not stuck. You can be in any situation you're in, but there's always a way out, you know, and just to give hope and not to give up, you know, and to, you know, don't hurt getting on your knees and thanking God for all your blessings, you know, every now and then. It for me on this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, copies of the book being sold by Fordham University Press. Alan and I will sign them for you. And there's also, I believe, wings and plantains to eat, which I am definitely going to take advantage of. Thank you so much for coming.